Hello, I'm Sandra Noble, a member of the African American Quilt and Doll Guild and the moderator of this panel of artists. In conjunction with our visual presentation, Retrospective 2, 2021, AAQD reflects Black history and culture. Six members of our guild are going to highlight their experiences as artists. In advance, I would like to thank Regina Abernathy, Barbara Eady, Gloria Kellen, Mary Pinckney, Barbara Townsend, and Felicia Tinker. Thank you. Hello, my name is Regina Abernathy, and I am an art quilter most of the time. My quilts are inspired by the conversations I have with older relatives and friends. The conversations are somewhat exciting and sometimes very sad. I had a conversation with my older cousin. He was 91, his name was Ray, and his wife, Honey, she was 89. And they inspired me to create two quilts. I asked Ray, why did he leave Tuskegee, Alabama and come to Cleveland, Ohio? And, and Honey said, to follow her. And we laughed and he said that was true because she was fine. But he said he really came because he didn't want to go to jail anymore. And I said to him, jail? He said, yeah, I got arrested for walking down the street. And for me, that was foreign. So I asked him to explain. And he told me that he had just gotten out of the Navy. World War II had ended and he had returned to Tuskegee, Alabama, and he was happy to return. And one day he got up and he put on his clothes and he decided to go for a walk. And he forgot and he walked into a white space. He walked onto a white sidewalk and he was arrested immediately. And the judge uh, gave him six months hard labor and he began to cry. And it was at that time that I realized that history isn't history for everybody. History is somebody's life. And even though he was 90, it still hurt him that this experience had occurred and that trauma was still in him. So he inspired me to create a quilt and I created the Negro Motorist Green Book, which more or less, and I had to do some research but it more or less explained that <clears throat> African Americans were restricted in their movement and the laws, these unjust laws, had allowed, um, had allowed the society to arrest them for minor infractions. And so while we were having this conversation, and again, I, I, I created this quilt called the Negro Motors Green Book. And while we were having this conversation, Honey, his wife, interrupted and said, well, you know, Tuskegee, Alabama was a sundown town. I had never heard of that. She said, oh, there were, there were many, many sundown towns, at least a thousand. And during the sundown town, when the sun went down, African-Americans had to be in the house. It didn't matter how old they were. So men, women, children, adults began to run home, literally run when the sun came down. And they knew that if they weren't in the house, they could be arrested, they could be hung, they could be sent to work on farms, African, not farms, uh, yes, farms for white America, and they would receive free labor. So they would also disappear. There were no phone calls to tell people where you were. So African American men in particular would disappear. So all these people would be running home. So I thought to myself, I can create a quilt about that. But then Ray continued that conversation. He said, well, you know, when we came to Cleveland, we had to continue that practice. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we would tell our children, when the street lights came on, you better have your behind on that porch. And I said, why? He said, because you're still in danger. There were no black policemen. 
There were nobody, there was no one to protect you. So we just say, have your behind home when the street lights came on. So when I was young, all these children, when the street lights came on, we began to run. And we were practicing that same uh, running that they did in the South. But now it was for the children. So I said, well, Ray, why didn't you tell us? He said, well, we didn't want to not look like men. And we still wanted you to be children. We didn't want you to know all the pain and suffering we were going through. So from there, that inspired me to create another quilt. And that quilt was called The Golden Time of Day. And on that quilt, we have children running, adults running, and the sun is going down. And so it can represent the South where they were in sundown towns, or it can represent the North whereby children were taught to be home when the street lights went on. I'm Barbara Eady, and I'm an African-American quilter. I come from a family of women who sewed their own clothes, and my mother was also a weaver. She had a huge loom that she kept in the attic in our house, and at night, I would sit with her while she weaved. I would sit on the floor and watch the shuttle clock go back and forth, back and forth. It was a very soothing thing in my life. And when I grew up, I also became a person who made things. And now being a quilter has been a very soothing and comforting part of my life, especially since we've been confined to home uh, for so many months. Uh, quilting has been a blessing to me. My mission is to create art that reflects the beauty of our people and of our stories. I'm a storyteller, and as a storyteller, I always aim to let people feel what I'm feeling. And as an artist, I want you to see what I see. So I brought one quilt with me today. This one is called Fierce Girls. This was taken at a family reunion where these children were surrounded by generations of adults who loved them. And you can see that, and you can see the confidence that they have. Uh, that's why I call them fierce. They feel free, especially on this particular day. And um, they're surrounded by people who encourage them and love them. That's what I want you to see in this quilt, to see who we are, to see what I see. Ashe. My name is Felicia Tinker and I'm African-American quilt and doll maker. Uh, I've started quilting uh, coming out of a, a bereavement group and so it was a place to uh, put your pain. I've had people ask me, why would you take fabric, cut it up to put it back together? And I often think of all the emotions involved between cutting it up, the creativity, and putting it back together. One of the pieces in the show uh, celebrates three Congresswomen of the 115th Congress. I like doing portrait quilts because it allows you to honor people, honor what they do, honor their lives, and that brings me joy. Hi, my name is Barbara Townsend, and I'm a doll maker with the Guild. I've been making dolls for two years now since I've joined the Guild. As a child, I really loved playing with dolls and I was brokenhearted when I went away to college and my mother threw away all of my dolls. I see dolls as three-dimensional sculptures that have meaning behind them, so before I create any doll, I see it in my head before it begins. My first doll um, is about me, myself, and I, and it just represents um, myself. And as a painter, I kind of tried to incorporate that into the doll and also the beading and quilting, since this was a, a quilting guild as well. Um, this doll in particular is, is true to my, close to my heart. I was asked to make a Black Lives Matter doll. And I, I thought of it as more representational than an actual doll piece. And it's a sculpture of a tree, and as you know, the tree began in the beginning um, in the Garden of Eden. 
And throughout the Bible, it indicates the tree. Even our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on a tree. And what I did with this particular piece, I embroidered all of the names of the slain um, African Americans. The leaves represent our culture. The faces and hands up. The tears are the tears that we cry. And then there are faces and hands throughout the piece, just as a representation. So this piece made me cry as I was making it because it just spoke to me so close and so close to home. My other dolls, uh, this is a storyteller doll, and I wanted to create a, a story that as you look at it and look into it, you can see the story happening before your eyes without someone actually telling you what's happening in the story. Um, I try to incorporate various mediums in my dolls. I don't just do cloth. I do paper. This, this particular doll is made of paper and cloth. Um, my latest doll, which is Sexy Ralph, he's a combination of a little bit of everything. So as a seamstress, I love to sew, and this making dolls is just a, a natural, it's become a natural thing for me, and I really enjoy doing it. And I really enjoy being in the guild because the doll makers that are in this guild are fantastic. They've each given me little clues and things to do or to incorporate in making dolls. And I just love what I'm doing. It's just a wonderful outlet. Um, I see things in my mind's eye. God's given me gifts that I, I didn't even know I had. And I see things and I have to create them. So thank you. Hi there, my name is Mary Pinckney and I'm a member of the African American Quilt and Doll Guild. Uh, I guess my adventure towards doll making actually began 18 years ago this week. Uh, kind of sad that I suffered a heart attack. And during my uh, you know, getting well, um, I went to a <clears throat> exhibition at the uh, IX Center and saw a doll display. And it just fascinated me. And when I talked to two of the ladies that had dolls in the uh, display, and they invited me to come to their, uh, their guild. The guild happened to be all the way in Aurora, but I finally joined, and I, I was with them for about five, six years. Um, I then discovered, I went to an art show, my son happens to be an artist, and I went to an art show, and one of the, doll, one of the artists there was a doll maker, and she invited me to come to the guild which I did. I joined. And this is what's happened. I, um, the dolls that you see here, the fabrics are what inspired, inspired me. The lady in red, I got that fabric years and years before I made her. And I just had to have the right way to display it. The second one, the fabric, was uh, a, a gift to me and I waited years before I made the doll. But, uh, and she happens to be, she's a prize winner. This is my latest, which um, someone asked me to make that doll and it took me quite a long time to do it, but I finally finished. Uh, the Doll Guild has given me uh, opportunity to travel and I enjoy all the ladies that are in it. Uh, and we have a lot of fun and <laughs> if you ever get the chance to come to one of our shows, you won't be, you won't be disappointed. Hello, my name is Gloria Kellen, and I'm a member of the African American Quilt and Doll Guild. I hope you are enjoying G Cuff's 2021 celebration of film. When I became a member of the doll guild and quilt guild i was i came as a doll maker i did not want to make quilts i made black dolls because i wanted our children and others to see that black dolls were beautiful and that they represented us they represented african americans but it was hard to see that in commercial black dolls. So I worked to make some dolls that were representative of our children. Soon I realized that 
I needed to tell stories about our history, to tell stories about things that, that I felt were important and that were a part of our heritage. And these stories could be told on quilts, narrative quilts or story quilts. There's a saying that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I believe it's true. And when you work on one story on a quilt, you as the quilter don't forget the story because it takes time. I would like to show you a quilt by about John P. Parker that I made. John P. Parker was an Ohioan that was amazing. He went through so many tremendous and amazing situations and he overcame so many things. John Parker, if we were to go from Ohio, from Cleveland, as far south as we could to the north, southern shore of Ohio, you would come to the Ohio River, and on the Ohio River sits Ripley, Ohio. At Ripley, Ohio, there is a little house, a two-story brick house that was built by John Parker. This house, this house is still standing today. At one time, there was a foundry by that house because John Parker had a thriving business in which he hired whites and African Americans to work in the foundry. This location was right across the river, the Ohio River, from Kentucky, a slave state. And many slaves came this far when they ran away. They got to the woods of Kentucky and they couldn't get across the Ohio River. The Ohio River was the problem. And they, would, they couldn't swim. They needed a boat. They were afraid to trust people. And so... John Parker figured out how he could help his people have a better life. When John Parker settled there in Ripley at night, he, would, he figured out that he could take his boat, which was so tiny, he would take his boat when the moon was right and the water was calm, he would get his boat out, row across the Ohio River at, to Kentucky. And along the shoreline, he would find runaways that he could help. And this story, the book was called Freedom River, is about John Parker when he helped a couple. So one night, John Parker set out because the moon was bright and the water was calm. And he rode across to meet a couple, to bring them across. When he got there, John said, are you ready? And, he, and the man said, no, we can't go. John said, what do you mean you can't go? The master has our baby. They put the baby in their bed at night so we won't leave, so we won't run away. And my wife won't leave. She won't leave without the baby. John said, man, go get your baby. But he just hung his head. He was ashamed that he was afraid. So John said, well, tomorrow I will come back and you go get that baby and be ready. So the next night, 
John, the moon was right and the water was calm and John rode across the river. And when he got there, he said, are you ready? And they didn't answer. We, at first, you didn't get the baby, he said. So John said, he would get him. And he took off his shoes and he told them, the the wife and the runaway to to put the shoes and keep his shoes. And Mary, he started up. Mary said, wait, wait. There's a barking dog. And there is a creak by their bedroom door. Be careful. The floor creaks. They'll catch you. And then the runaway Slade said, you have to be careful. They keep a lamp by their bed. It is lit. They keep a gun on one side of their bed. So be careful. John started up the shore, up the sh bank, and then he got so far and the dog started barking. John reached in his pocket and pulled out the food, gave it to the dog, and patted the dog on the head. And the dog said, okay, <laughs> that's good. You paid your price. But anyway, he kept on going. And soon he came to the house door. He quietly opened the door because folks didn't really lock their doors at night at that time. So John walked across in front of the fireplace and he got to the bedroom door and he was careful. He didn't step on the loose board to make the noise. He opened the door inch by inch by inch. And then he looked in and he saw the couple sweeping. He saw the light. He saw the light on uh, beside on the table. And he saw the baby. And he saw the gun. John in his bare feet walked slowly over to the bed. And grabbed the baby and made it out of that house as fast as he could. And down the bank and into the, the boat. And he got in the boat. He gave the baby to the baby's mother. And then they rowed. John rowed as fast as he could across the Ohio River. And when he got to the other side. John gave the family, but he said, wait a minute, where are my shoes? The runaway said he, he didn't know what happened to the shoes, but John sent them on with the next conductor, and John made it to his house and went in his house. There, he and he shut the door, went upstairs to the second floor and watched out of the window because he knew what was coming. Pretty soon, the owner, the master, was banging on the door. John Parker, John Parker, you open this door. You have my slaves. Where are my slaves? Oh, he was so mad. He had gotten his friends. He was mad. They wanted to take John Parker and hang him. John Parker said, I don't have your slaves. The owner said, yes, you do. I have your shoes. And John said, what do you mean? And he pulled his other pair of shoes out because John was rich enough to have more than one pair of shoes. He pulled his shoes and showed them out the window. And John Parker had won once again and the slave owner went on down the street looking for his slaves. John Parker did this many, many times. 
he saved over 1,000 slaves. And then after the Emancipation Pro Proclamation, when slaves came across into Ohio, he helped many of them settle there in uh, Ripley and help them move on toward Canada. And that is the story of John Parker. You'll see on my quilt, you'll see the family of runaways. You'll see the boat. And you'll see John with the baby. I also made a doll that represents John and the baby. I hope you enjoyed the story. And there are many, many Underground Railroad stories that would make great quilts.